uh, dear followers, uh, we do welcome each of you to our workshop entitled Energy uh, Factor Sustainable Economic Development in South Caucasus Co 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 Model, organized by the International Center for Graduate Education of Azerbaijan State University Economics, UNEC, within the framework of the fourth International Scientific Conference of Researchers in Economics and Management, supported by the Pasha Holding Group of Companies. So we would like to have a, the, our valuable guests and the, our valuable guests uh, will provide their own view and the approach regarding to energy security issue in the world, especially in the South Caucasus region. And the, from the prime of the international relation, political science, political economy, and also the international law, we'll be discussing the, some kind of key elements related to the energy efficiency, energy transition, and as well as the sustainable energy uh, efficiency in particular countries in European countries and also South Caucasus countries and mainly focusing on the energy conflict and the disputable issue in the contemporary global politics as well and uh, first of all I would like to give a brief explanation regarding the energy policy and um, uh, could you see the presentation um, could you see no not yet no now it works okay it works yes, yes. Okay, so the, I will give the brief information 10 minutes about the energy diplomacy and security issue in the South Caucasus region, the case of Azerbaijan. And when it comes to the outline, uh, we will prov I will provide information about the theoretical approach to energy resources, energy diplomacy of Azerbaijan, role of Azerbaijan in the European energy policy, and will provide the recommendation and the conclusion in the spaces. So I would like to mention that uh, as a, in political scientists, what uh, means the energy factors for the nation states? So we do know that the states now desire energy security in the same sense that they desire military and economic security, according to the Amelia Hatfields. And the, there is a mainly big interconnection between the energy policy, national security, and also the foreign policy among the nation states and the, some of the nation states try to have an energy issue in terms of the collaboration but when it comes to the other country for example in the in the course of the russia and other countries they use the energy diplomacy in a course way and they use energy com, uh, energy diplomacy not like the collaboration but mainly competition as well in the global diplomacy and the, when it comes to the national resources national resources mainly related with the domestic security issue if you have safe and secure national security and the national resources approach, it means that your energy security is also in a good set. So energy, according to your neoclassical realism, energy means the power elements. For example, uh, so in the South Caucasus region, compared to the, our, our neighbors, Azerbaijan has a, uh, like the flexible and also the abundant energy resources and we, we are well of energy resources so it means that the power elements related to the Azerbaijan domestic policy as well and the when it comes to the according to the Karen Stegen uh, Karen Stegen model energy resources are exclusively treated as element to force countries for example Russia forces the small countries uh, in terms of the sanction on the energy resources and etc in it is in the course way as well not in a collaborative way but Stegen model of energy Energy resources is called energy weapon. Some of the countries use the energy not like the collaboration, but mainly the energy weapons as well. For example, after the signal integration of the Soviet Union use of energy resources with the aim of achieving the foreign policy objective was the most frequent in the post-Soviet space by Russia. So However, this policy cannot be applied for all the nations having energy resources. For example, it cannot be applied to the uh, uh, European countries because the European countries take the uh, energy in a collaborative way. For example, trans adriatic pipeline and the trans anadolu pipeline issue, so the gas carrier related to Azerbaijan as well. And the, so the energy can be used as an instrument 
or weapon or special energy space statecraft when it comes to the special country like Turkey, EU, and Azerbaijan. So energy weapon is not equal to the energy in, uh, instrument, and they are not equal in terms of the more assertive way and also more persuasive and collaborative way. For example, Turkey also uses energy resources in a more persuasive and a collaborative way, uh, uh, like uh, equal to the Azerbaijan as well. And uh, so what is the triadic nexus? There is a big interconnection between energy, national security or internal security and foreign policy issue. What means that, as I mentioned too, according to the neoclassical realism that if you have a successful domestic policy, it means that you have a good set energy policy as well. If your energy resources are established in a good way, so it means that your foreign policy is also professional and is able to provide a national policy issue. And the, what about the national power? And when it comes to the national power, we can uh, consider that the national power in energy sector is determined by geographical and technological determinism, economic capacity and political decision of the state. So it means the state must have the energy resources within its territory. So it means that energy limited to the territorial principality. The state must be able to extract them economically, need to use them, uh, exploit them in an effective way and also in an efficient way by using available and the cutting edge technologies as well. And the state must have the economic resources for developing extraction, effective production and the refining and export of the products as well. Responsible decision maker of the state must have a political will to exploit and export resources. And uh, as I mentioned that energy is an effective instrument or state craft of achieving its foreign policy, indicator of the national prosperity and underwrite the domestic security of each nation state having or possessing national resources. And also there is the effective implementation of energy diplomacy. So energy security as variable in terms of the security of demands. And in terms of the security of the supply, security of supply mainly having the issue of the sustainability and safe shipment of resources. For example, EU rely on relied on the Azerbaijan energy sustainability and those the secure rules of the secure shipment of the energy resources via South, uh, uh, Southern Gas Corridor. So providing sustainability, efficient and security of the energy resources. What about the key principle? According to the American scholar, US scholar, Jan Kalichi and David Goldwyn's standpoint, the key principle of the energy security composed of the diversification of the energy resources, stable global energy market, security marginalization process, high quality information and research and development. You need to have the aware information. For example, in Azerbaijan, we do have lack information. For example, uh, about the energy resources, we need to raise awareness within the community related to the effective implementation of the both exhaustible resources, for example, conventional resources in the example of oil and gas. At the same time, uh, in the non-conventional energy resources, like the traditional, uh, like the non-traditional energy resources, renewable energy resources. When it comes to the security ma margin, when you go beyond regarding the security margin, your energy uh, security policy will fail as well. Energy diplomacy of Azerbaijan. So energy, when it comes to energy security issue, energy security is considered one of the main priorities of Azerbaijan within its internal and foreign policy agenda. Azerbaijan possessing rich traditional energy resources, oil and gas, and Azerbaijan is a net exporter of oil and gas. However, there is a huge dependency, huge reliance in gas sector, and it is, but it, it, it's not probably good for the future generation as well. So efficient geographical location providing utilization of natural resources, the base of the economy and social stability in the region. As I mentioned, Azerbaijan crude oil makes up for one third of consumption. Natural gas production accounts for two thirds of the consumption and the domestic energy consumption as well. So what about the basic principle of our country? Azerbaijan try to provide the efficient use of energy resources. We need the harmonization and the balance of national and non national traditional and non-traditional energy resources because there is no harmonization between them there is no legal management policy regarding the how we can effectively implement or establish the energy agent regarding the rene renewable energy resources in the country so we need to provide the same like the conception com uh, like the um, for both for the traditional and also non-existable energy resources here is a graph like the national gas constituted for the 68%, but it's going to 
just dramatically increase unfortunately it's actually not good for the future uh, do not face any kind uh, uh how can i say like them uh, any kind of limitless and any kind of uh, um, how can i say like the non-development as well and the when it comes to the potential renew azerbaijan has a good geographical location in terms of the and also the climate regarding to the uh, renewable energy resources we do have the wind power solar power biomass geothermal power hydropower however there is no any kind of direct legal leg energy legislation. At the same time, we do not have the cutting gauge technologies to provide or to exploit these resources as well. We do have, but it's not like enough for the effective implementation of these resources. And uh, uh, for example, uh, in Karabakh region, as you know, so, as you know that after the second Karabakh war, Azerbaijan liberated the seventh district and also the some part of the Karabakh region, including Shah. But Azerbaijan Karabakh region is uh, having the well of resources, especially the green energy resources. Like that's why Azerbaijan now focused mainly on the implementation, the establishment of the renewable energy resources and the green energy uh, try to um, transfer the city to the uh, smart city and also the green energy field. That's why I try to have a good cooperation with different companies, for example, Japanese companies, Swiss companies for the reconciliation of the cities, Japanese companies, Tokyo Electric Power Services, TEPSCO, for example, prepare concept and the master plan for creating green energy zone in the Karabakh region because there is need the implementation of the project and utilization of these resources in the region, including wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, bioenergy, energy efficiency technology, and etc. What is the domestic limitation of their implementation and their utilization of the resources in our country? Lack of infrastructure for the flexible use of renewable energy resources that we are not, but the Azerbaijan tried to make investigation and the FDI to this region, not only to Karabakh region, but also to Azerbaijan, more dependence on traditional energy resources. As I mentioned that Azerbaijan is a net exporter and try to provide the gas shipment to the European countries and also other countries, Russia as well. Lack of green energy expertise in the domestic area. Unfortunately, we do have the green energy expertise and also we do have the uh, lack of green, uh, like the energy and also the green economic growth as well. So, and also there is a lack of renewable energy legislation. We do have the legislation, but it's not proper for the establishment and the implementation, future implementation of the rest in the country. What could be the possible solution? It's like the improving the security of Azerbaijan transit and export pipeline network, setting up energy infrastructure or ad administrative mechanism based on the Western standard, developing comprehensive energy demand and also energy demand management policy in Azerbaijan. We do have the diversification of energy resources at the same time, harmonization of the res uh, harmonization of the resources, both exhaustible resources and non-exhaustible resources. And also finally, effective, sustainable, secure utility utilization of both traditional and alternative resources. When it comes to the strategic roadmap of our country, our country's strategic roadmap uh, is mainly focused on the modernization and expansion project on alternative energy resources, rehabilitation of the infrastructure at the Azerbaijan thermal power plant and the privatization of the power plant as well. Uh, there is some kind of issue or one-sided monopolization of the power plants. However, we need to focus on the privatization of the power plant and the foreign direct investment from the European countries and also the other Western countries as well. And also some of the flexible and the famous well-known companies from the Asia as well. And uh, when it comes to the European energy policy, we would like to give brief information that Azerbaijan is considered the reliable energy partner, even in the Ukraine and the Russian war, as also Azerbaijan uh, is a reliable partner for the European countries. And also Azerbaijan will be able to provide energy resources and affordable prices, is also try to diversify, uh, diversify the energy routes of the EU, harmonization of EU energy bazaar, and also lessons and will lessen its dependence upon Russia gas resources. As we know that European countries have a huge dependence of the Russia and the 
European Union countries are really afraid of the general, uh, like the future sanction of the Russia, which show itself in the historical and the political occasion before in 2015 and others. And uh, when it comes to the main direction of the EU, solidarity and the energy security issue, integrated and the secure energy market of the EU, diversification of the energy resources, decarbonization of the economy, and the energy union also based on the competitive and the research and development. One of the one of the lack of our uh, in the country is like the research and development. We need to raise the awareness of the community uh, about the energy policy and of the uh, uh, implementation and the effective use of that. And we need the prior art research and the research and development. Air art and the policy in the country for the effective use and the implementation of this policy as well. Here's the three pillars of the EU energy policy, not uh, due to the limited time and just move on to. And as I mentioned that now Azerbaijan tried to deliver the resources within the southern gas carrier uh, via trans adriatic pipeline, uh, like via Turkey to directly to the other European country, Greece, and then Italy via trans adriatic, uh, trans -Adriatic pipeline. And the, here is a roadmap for the TANAP and the TAP as well. The main part of this, this two, TAP with the Azerbaijan Turkey, Trans Adriatic Pipeline, TANAP as a Trans Anadolu Pipeline within the Turkey and Azerbaijan. Trans Adriatic Pipeline is within Azerbaijan Turkey and also the European countries. It's the main part of the Southern Gas Carrier project, and the, which is already implemented from the um, end of 2020. And the when it comes to the, how Azerbaijan benefits from in, uh, entering the EU market, Azerbaijan achieve and will also achieve in the future diversification of export network and it will create a connection with the new partners and the new investment will go moving to, to the new energy market in the future, modernization of the energy infrastructure. Azerbaijan also will get the Western standards to provide and establish them renewable energy policy in Azerbaijan, try to accept the new policy agenda and try to make the new efficient, efficient operation mechanism in the country as well. We need to, we need to, how can I say, use and work with the effective environmental management issue. We have the environmental issue as well. First, we need to have a research and development in the environmental cases, then we can move on to the green energy policy as well. And the, what about the EU benefits from the energy collaboration with Azerbaijan? There is a transportation security from Azerbaijan is considered as of the great importance to the EU, EU harmonize its energy market, gets gas via tap in a secure way through Turkey, directly to the European countries like Greece and then Italy, and then just uh, disseminated through the different ways to the European countries in an equal way. And also the EU is able to invest in renewable energy resources future in Azerbaijan areas, especially in specific regions like Karabakh as well. When it comes to the conclusion, I would like to mention one thing that, as I mentioned and highlighted many times, that Azerbaijan is a main export of oil and gas resources. However, as exhaustible resources in the future, it can affect the country's economic development in a worse way. Azerbaijan has to reduce its dependence over conventional energy resources and balance the consumption of the both traditional and renewable energy resources as well. And the Azerbaijan is paying less attention to the renewable energy sector, try to move and provide establishment and also the development in these cases, but as I mentioned, that we need to direct investment, new air and D uh, policy, and also the environmental management policy as well. And here is the reference. And uh, thank you so much for your attention and consideration. And if there is any question, I could answer. If not, we could move on to the our next session, our next valuable guest. So, no questions? Okay. Uh, now I would like to introduce your, bring your attention to our valuable guest and the speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Ana Maria Salinas de Frias, Chair of International Public Law and International Relations at the University of Malaga, ad hoc judge at the European Court of Human Rights on behalf of Spain, President of Spanish Society of International Law and ISIL board member. For example, greetings, um, Professor Anna, and the um, audience like the is your skin is you. Thank you very much, Nargis, for your kind introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this uh, 
this uh, sound uh, congress, this important uh, international conference where I had the opportunity to, to take part in the first uh, roundtable already. And it's a pleasure for me to, to share this, this uh, roundtable with this, uh, uh, these uh, remarkable uh, colleagues uh, or women, I have to remark, so that's good news. Thank you so much for for uh, this introduction, and I will try to share my my screen with you if if it works. Okay. Let's see if it works. Is it okay? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, the topic I was I'm sorry. Um, we start from the very beginning. <laughs> Uh, the, the topic I was proposed was to talk about energy resources and international conflicts, as my field uh, is my main field of research is international law. So um, I would like to go through uh, some general remarks then to to think of which would be the more the more important questions to be reflected on, and then uh, a brief review, if possible, about main conflicts related to energy along history. Uh, coming from the First World War, because we will see very quickly how both concepts are uh, closely interconnected, and finally, a uh, potential models that we can infer from the point of view of in international relations existing between energy resources and international conflicts uh, going on nowadays. So, uh, in according to raising on those ideas, I'd like first of all uh, focus your attention on some general remarks. If we pay attention to the relations between Russia and Ukraine, Chinese and Russian strategic uh, good relations over the couple uh, of years uh, or even more, if we put attention on the Libyan conflict or the Syrian crisis, uh, for instance, when the uh, Council, the, the UN Council, the Security Council couldn't adopt any resolution concerning the Syrian war. The Sudanese uh, problem, which contributed to the partition of the country into two African states, transitional political crisis and resource nationalization having taken place in Venezuela, who, which has impacted uh, very much Latin America a landscape uh, on uh, strategic uh, use of resources and production of resources and trade of energy. Um, the uh, tactical uh, role played by America in Middle East, Russia's ambivalent geopolitical design in the post-Soviet space, and the European Union's forced expansion in the oil-rich regions of Asia are some of the instances which, in my view, demonstrate that the fact that the root causes of these geopolitical strategic trajectories are closely related to the demand and uh, supply of energy. If we quote the words of the American uh, Secretary of Home Affairs um, in the 40s, um, he said, uh, he stated, if we, there should be, if there should be a World War III, it will have to be fought with someone else's petroleum because the United States wouldn't have it. Yes. And they seem to be like prophetic words because uh, they have proven to be true if one, if one reflects uh, on the geopolitical development that took place during the Second World War when Germany uh, waged war to control all fields of Baku, for instance, and the Japanese aggression in Pearl Harbor in 1941. The same is happening in the post-Second World War phase also. This can be evident from the policy being pursued by America in the West Asian region and the subsequent energy crisis. The crisis contributed to the formation of uh, the uh, organization of uh, countries, exporters of uh, uh, oil uh, for the first time in history. And the present century is also not free from this threat. The growing energy insecurity in and around the world is largely due to price fluctuation as well as the nature of demand and supply, as Anagis has very well explained before. One issue which is uh, assuming growing significance in the polemics of energy security is how the so-called global south perceives the whole trajectories. Global South is one of the largest producers of hydrocarbon reserves and also suffered most because of the negative aspects associated with energy security. Entire discourses on Global South owes its origin to the oil crisis which shook 
the global politics in the 70s, when the Arab world defied the West and started fixing the prices of oil, which fetched them extra dollar. This in turn shaped the structure of international relations through bargaining and to some extent mm, contributed to establish a just world or a, a more just world order. The status quo nature of international relations underwent a sharp change in recent years with the emergence of BRICS and also the G20 formations or forums. These blocks are providing necessary impetus to energy bargaining with the rich North. Geography lies at the basis of history, it has been said. The development of historical phenomenon took place in a geographical setting, obviously. The climatic conditions along which natural resources not only shaped the stages of economic development of a country, but also influenced its external policy making processes, which is uh, more and more evident nowadays. The classical geopolitical thinkers reflected on the idea of annexation and exploration of natural resources, which paves the way for global dominance of a particular state or a political entity. The defeat of German in the in Germany of the Second World during the Second World War, growing dominance of America in the international affairs, as well as emergence of post-Second World War structure of international system, resulted in newer way of approaching the global geopolitical development. Since the emergence of energy as a strategic commodity, there is a whirlpool of competition among the great powers to secure exactly the same. The rivalry among the international state actors to get scarce natural resources to some extent also contributed to the geographical proliferation of both the First and the Second World Wars. The primary incubator for conflict during the interwar period can be traced back to the need for security, securing energy resources. If we look at the interrelationship between energy and global structure of international relations, what one can infer is that the former provides a framework through which states try to shape their policy in extracting resources from energy rich regions of the world. This can be evident from the behavior of major superpowers like the United States and the Soviet Union at times towards the energy rich region of West Asia. When the British Empire spreads its desire and uh, to end an suzerainty in this part of the world, America immediately expressed its desire to fill the vacuum to ensure an uninterrupted supply of energy from this part of the world. The American penetration in this part of the world was matched with equal force by the then Soviet Union. It cultivated Iraq, which, of course, as a major oil producer, and tried to balance American presence in this part of the world. There are innumerable st case studies to demonstrate that the global hunger for energy and accentuation of growing crisis over demand and supply is shaping both the nature and the structure of international polities. At its it has been already remarked by the moderator. The best elucidation can be evident from the policy being pursued by America towards the Caspian region, but also by the European Union nowadays, as it has been already said. Washington's strategy is being aimed at harnessing energy resources from this region through providing financial assistance and diverting supply sources from this region, thus bypassing Moscow, which was the main interest. There is a fear emanating since the Strait of Hormuz is located closely to the Ira Iranian maritime boundary. It might hinder the passage of oil from West Asia to other regions of the world. This may also impair the free flow of energy, of energy uh, in the case of China through the South China Sea. This area is becoming a major flashpoint for transportation of energy resources through the disputes involving China, not only with Japan, 
but also in more general terms with the European Union and in particular with Vietnam and the Philippines. Um, and you know also the expansionist view of China in the South, uh, the um, South China Sea, where uh, China is trying to uh, to uh, make their territory through islands bigger, augmenting the size of the islands. So um, accessing to wider maritime spaces in in this uh, part of the world, which is contrary to international law, has been dealt with by the International Court of Justice. In particular, the, the key point, the hot point, is the access to the Strait of Malacca and the control of the state of Malacca, which connects South China Sea and Indian Ocean, uh, and, and which is going to be uh, an important point of controversy in the years to come. Since this strait is located at a tactical point, China is heavily dependent on it for getting oil from Africa, where China has so much invested during the last years but also for the oil being, uh, or the, the energy being supplied by uh, Latin America through uh, Venezuela, um, whom uh, China is developing a very close relationship, even uh, shallowing the relation between Latin, uh, between Venezuela, sorry, and uh, Russia in the past. So China is adopting a multiple launch strategy, like providing liberal aid, investment, etc., to achieve the core goal of harnessing energy. Uh, this being said as a way of introduction, which are the main questions to be answered in this situation? Well, first, to what extent will oil scarcity and the quest for energy security continue to shape the grand strategy of great powers? Um, energy security is a major concern for Chinese and European strategists, obviously, also for Russians and many of the countries in the world, great powers in general, of course. The relationship between energy and great power grand strategy will thus remain an important issue for international security analysts, as has been already pointed out. Second, to what extent will energy politics shape the Middle East and its relationship with external powers in the 21st century? Oil turned the Middle East into one of the most contested strategy, strategic regions of the world after the crisis in 1973. The Persian Gulf remains crucial for global oil markets, but recent global uh, or geopolitical um, changes, global changes, and unconventional energy sources. You know that the uh, United States is, is uh, in, investing very much in the fracking technique. Um, recent, uh, recent changes and unconventional energy resources, like this way of extracting energy, which may make the United States so sufficient in a way, uh, in the case of energy, have altered perceptions of the region's geopolitical significance, how these changes will affect global oil markets and the fragile political environment in the Persian Gulf is a major question for the future, obviously. Third, to what extent will energy shape international rivalries among this, the great powers? Today, the United States and China compete over control of strategic maritime oil supply roads and sea lines of communication in the South China Sea. In Europe, disputes over natural gas and strategic pipelines, uh, also mentioned before, shape the dynamics of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, obviously, the war nowadays, and why the relations between China and the, uh, sorry, uh, Russia and the European Union are uh, in a very bad situation nowadays uh, due to the war in Ukraine and uh, mainly chaired by uh, sanctions, economic sanctions of the EU against Russia. A deeper understanding of the ways in which oil and other energy sources shape conflict between the great powers will be crucial to address these geopolitical challenges. In fourth place, to what extent will petro-aggression or so-called petro-aggression and related mechanisms continue and how will great powers respond to them? In the past, Oil allowed revolutionary leaders in petri states to pursue an aggressive foreign policy and to provide funding for terrorist and insurgent groups in many places around. 
Our own possibility is that consumer economies motivated by, uh, in part by uh, ethical considerations will begin to boycott so-called blood oil. Who knows? Let's see if this ethical question will finally preside this kind of trade. Fifth, how will future demand for energy, especially oil, affect international conflict? If prices decline over the long run, they would lower the value of charity that contains oil and gas resources. And so this will weaken incentives for territorial conquest. This might be good news in the light of maritime resource disputes, resource disputes in the South, South China Sea. Uh, but uh, decreasing oil prices might also undermine governance institutions in petri state dependent on income from oil and lead to domestic unrest and civil war that could affect neighboring countries or trigger external military intervention also. Finally, how will the growth of renewable affect international conflict as it has been already mentioned the attention we need to pay to renewable sources of energy historically energy transitions have had major political consequences so let's see what happens but it is obvious that in light of these questions uh, the research uh, the research agenda has to be changed and should focus on energy in the context of the biggest issues in international relations economic prosperity, social prosperity, environmental sustainability, including the proposition of uh, defining ecocide, so the strong harm made to human environment by burning oil resources, or other sources of energy, war, uh, and the role they play in war and peace. The new research agenda should address a variety of countries and regions ranging from Russia to Venezuela and from Europe to the Middle East. Yet, the, there are issues uh, that seem especially important. The U.S. role in the Middle East, but also the turn, uh, the, the very much uh, attention paid nowadays to pipelines and gas as a source of energy, not only oil, and also uh, the, the way of getting an easier access to gas and the attention focused now on the West Asian area and in particular Azerbaijan. Uh, having said this, uh, a brief uh, review of main conflicts related to energy. I won't take uh, too long on this because I don't want to, uh, to, to go uh, uh, beyond my time. Uh, obviously, um, we need to make the distinction between uh, direct effects and contextual effects as for uh, energy and conflict, but obviously um, they, um, there are situations, it's not easy or it's not so clear to say that uh, resources or economic or, I'm sorry, uh, energy uh, resources are the main uh, objective of any war, any armed conflict, but obviously put in a context they play a major role in those uh, conflicts or in solving those countries and those conflicts too um it was crucial for the um the breakout of uh, world war first obviously and the problem of oil scarcity and the way in which uh, great powers at that time behave in order to secure those sources of energy in order to secure not only the economic capacity but mainly also their internal security and defense national defense. It was the same during World War II and the attempt of, of uh, Germany to, to block and to control uh, petrol oil in here in Azerbaijan, in Baku, and also other movements um, by other powers in order to counter the attitude by Germany. But also after World War II, uh, uh, conflicts between um, states belonging to the same side, we would say, uh, conflicts with the, of the uh, United States, for instance, and Russia being on the same side at that time against France or Israel, also uh, United Kingdom, when they tried to counter the uh, the action of NASA in na nationalizing this the canal of Suez, the canal of Suez, and beyond uh, 1973 with the creation of the OPEC, the petro aggressions. Uh, um, carried out by Libya, uh, Iraq uh, over Kuwait or Iran 
also in the same area in, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, obviously, the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the problem it, it um, um, creates for everyone around uh, us for the prices of oil, we were shocked. Professor Delgado and myself uh, uh, at the at our arrival in in Baku when we saw the prices of oil because it's so cheap here it's been crazy expensive all over Europe in Spain is around two euros per liter nowadays and it is being subsidized by the government even though because it's been very very uh, harmful for agriculture uh, or, or for transport public transport etc. And also, um, I'd like to, uh, without coming into details of those historical uh, stages, uh, the potential models we can infer from international conflict, which is uh, at the end of the day, the main objective of this presentation. So according to what we can, uh, we can check along history concerning um, relationship between conflicts, international conflicts in particular, uh, armed conflicts and and um, international really, uh, and uh, um, providing um, or the, the provision of uh, energy resources, uh, the conflicts can follow uh, or the relationship can follow different models. For instance, there can be wars, of course, caused by the existence of natural resources, but it's natural resources, uh, energetic resources. Don't forget, please, as I try to re to recall to myself, water is a natural resource, it's not an energy resource in itself, uh, strictly considered, but it's going to be a key resource, a key uh, factor in uh, some parts of the world, in particular in Africa, where China has acquired most of the biggest uh, resources or, or, or um, accumulation of water all over Africa. So it's going to have a key value, an strategic value, and a very important trade uh, value also in the future, in the coming future. So war caused by the existence of national resources, it's not that clear that they owe their, their existence only to the existence of natural resources, but these resources play a major role uh, in the development of this kind of complex. Tensions due to trends to market domination, that was the case after World War II, well, the triggering uh, situation for uh, the breakout of the of the war, obviously, but also the the important or the essential, the crucial trend marked by major states such as the United Kingdom and uh, the USA after World War II concerning the production of oil in, in Middle East. Grievances related to exploitation of natural resources within states. This is another model that we can infer from those historical facts and the conflicts going on even nowadays. So when uh, and it was used by ISIS, for instance, uh, the terrorist uh, group uh, having a great power uh, after 2014-15 in uh, on Iraq and Syria. Uh, the uh, grievances um, on how. Of third states exploit natural resources of a country and using these kind of grievances to to uh, to radicalize population in a country. This the so-called petro aggression. So uh, states uh, being big producer and having a lot of incomes from oil trade, that money either to uh, finance other groups or other uh, aggressive states or to uh, commit these kind of aggressions by themselves, such as um, Iraq with Kuwait, petro insurgencies, so um, movements that gain power thanks to these kind of uh, incomes. Another model, externalization of civil wars in petro states, which is a very, um, a very um, dangerous uh, probably, probability always. So the possibility of when one of those conflicts has, uh, take, takes place within a important producer, a state producer of oil, uh, the possibility of uh, exporting these kind of, of uh, conflicts to uh, neighboring countries, or uh, which is more more unfortunate nowadays is let's say the problem with pipelines and and um, transit roads of gas, uh, not only oil, but also gas, as we experienced with uh, Russia and Ukraine some years ago when uh, Russia cut 
the provision of gas uh, through Ukraine and Ukraine let, was left without gas during the winter and the gas didn't reach uh, um, didn't reach um, Europe and now they, they obviously the distortion movements of Russia in Nagorno Karabakh in order to control resources in, in Azerbaijan. trying to, to disturb, which is sanctioning. Um, and finally, all scarcity and multilateralism, which kind of consequences uh, this might have on um, on the, the association So I think there is a technical problem. There is a technical problem that Mrs. Anna just went out and uh, maybe she will come back soon and uh, for not to uh, for not uh, losing our time I would like to uh, introduce our second guest uh, our second guest is valuable guest is Dr. Tekla Tsep, Associate Professor, Expert on Economics, Institute of World and Regional Economics, Faculty of Economics at the Miskoch University in Hungary. Uh, thank you for taking your time for joining us for the discussion, valuable discussion in this field. Uh, so Dr. Tekla Tsep, the turn is yours, please. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I just need a sec for sharing my screen. Uh, somehow I can't see my slide, but yeah, just a sec, I fix it. <sighs> there are always technical issues, right? <laughs> we are waiting, no worries, just one or two minutes. Okay. Okay, I got a message that my browser blocked my screen. Oh my God. Okay, but half an hour ago, it worked. So I don't know why it doesn't work anymore. But Um, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we already saw your presentation. Mrs. Okay. Anna, you had a technical problem, no worries. And uh, you could conclude your like the speech within one or two minutes after having done with Mr. Tekla, okay? And we will have a questions to you for the discussions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you. I just need a final confirmation that you see my slide and my screen. Can you confirm it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, okay. So thank you for this uh, kind uh, introduction. So my name is Tekla Sip. I'm associate professor at the University of Miskolc in Hungary. So now I would like to continue with our most important energy target regarding energy transition. You know energy transition nowadays everywhere, at policy level, in our strategic documents, climate and energy policies. And uh, it has to be, at the same time, green, sustainable, fair, rapid, transparent, broad and affordable. And basically my question is that how we can do it, because now we have some problem regarding the energy transition. I mean, now we are facing with an energy crisis. We are facing with the war, with sanctions, embargoes, and it was already not in good shape uh, a year ago before the energy uh, prices started to increase. So in my presentation, uh, I talk about our global framework, so basically what kind of external factors um, affect our climate and energy policy in the European Union. I will talk about our 2020, 2030 and 50, uh, 2050 uh, energy and climate targets, so what kind of uh, process we did, what we should uh, do in the near future and in the long-term future, how our policy, the documents, the strategies uh, changed in the last one year because of the soaring energy crisis and because of the war. And uh, I will talk about the national responses and how big um, differences and inequalities can be observed among the European member states. and. Of course, at the end, I will give you a short conclusion. So um, I'm sure that all of you, you are aware of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. We can um, say that basically nowadays the SDGs uh, create the frame, the framework for our energy and climate policy. And uh, for us, the SDG 7 and the SDG 13 are the most important goals. SDG 7 is about to ensure the affordable, clean and modern energy for all. The 13th goal is about climate actions, mitigations and adaptation uh, policies. Of course, the European energy and climate policy uh, faces with many, many questions, challenges, and problems. Here you see that the list is really long, what means that basically we can say that the energy transition was already really slow before the war started and before the energy crisis has started. And of course, these external factors or these happenings uh, just made it more serious, all of these uh, challenges. Um, here you can see the 2020 goals and okay at the end uh, so the European Union achieved all of our targets regarding the emission the renewable energy sources and energy efficiency improvements so we are good but the only reason that we could achieve these goals was the COVID so the global pandemic so because of the restrictions the curfews that the people have started to work remotely, it was the only reason that we could do it. Because if you look at the 2019 data, it is uh, the second bubble in, in all rows. You can see that we, we really lagged behind in 2019. Only the emission data was fine and okay, but regarding the renewables and uh, primary and final energy consum consumption, they refer to the uh, energy efficiency targets, we seriously lag behind. And only because of the COVID, we could fulfill the 2020 goals. Now we look forward and now we have the 2030 and 2050 goals. I'm sure that all of you know it well, 
that the European Union set a goal regarding we have to become carbon neutral until 2050. So this is about the net zero emission strategy. And 2030 is basically a midterm goal. So until 2030, we have to cut uh, our greenhouse gas emission by at least 40 percentage. But now uh, the European Union raised or increased this target. So now the new target is 55 percentage. Um, we have to increase the share of renewable energy sources in final energy consumption uh, to 30 uh, to percentage, but last year the European Commission submitted an amendment and they raised it to 40 percentage. And when the war started, when Russia uh, and uh, the Ukraine war started, uh, the European Union created a new strategy, a new document. It was um, released in in March or. Yeah, just a few weeks later, as the war started, it is called Repower Europe. And now the goal is 45 percentage. And the goal, the target regarding energy efficiency didn't uh, change at all. So it is still 32.5 percentage. And uh, if you look at the 2020 targets, you see that there are serious differences among the European member states and nearly all member states are lagging behind in at least one goal. If you just look at Bulgaria or Romania or Hungary or even Belgium as a Western country or Germany, we have serious um, yeah, problems regarding meeting or achieving these goals. And uh, if we look at the... SDG 7 and SDG 13, there are also serious problems um, can be pointed out, which refers to the slow progress in energy transition. In the long term, it's kind of okay, but if we look at the short term data, we can see many um, cells marked with orange and, and red color, and you see that mainly in energy efficiency and uh, in the renewable, the share of renewable energy sources, we have serious problems. Uh, in one of our um, latest research, we created a composite indicator measuring the energy transition and the sustainable energy performance of the member states. Of course, there is a progress, but our results also highlight the inequalities, the spatial inequalities of member states. And we see that mainly um, Eastern Central Europe is lagging behind. I mean, they are the laggard uh, in, in this rank. And of course, the best performer countries are the Scandinavian countries, the Baltic states, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so basically Western Europe. So we can conclude that the energy transition was already really slow and it just slowed down before the energy crisis started and before the war started. Uh, Eastern Central Europe is in a specific situation. Uh, you maybe know that uh, the energy consumption of the residential sector is uh, quite high. So the household sector are responsible for the largest share of the energy consumption. And if we look at the energy transition here, so how their energy mix is changing, it is also really bad, basically. And the speed of the energy transition here is also slowing down. And uh, here we still see that the energy consumption is tightly connected to the human development and the human well-being level. So when we are talking about reducing the energy consumption and when we are talking about decoupling and energy efficiency improvements, it also has to be mentioned that here the energy efficiency is, is still tightly connected to the human well-being, which means when people have more money, they are just buying more device and, and, they, and they, for example, uh, increase their indoor temperature 
for example, because uh, here nowadays many families are has to uh, keep cooler temperature in the winter time, or or as another coping strategy, for example, that they can't heat all of their rooms. And uh, there are three big reasons of that. The first one is that people here in Eastern Central Europe, many times they are living in low energy efficient uh, houses and, and dwellings. Uh, the energy prices are extremely high, but the disposable income is really low. It means that at the end, their energy expenditures in their regarding their total expenditures are, are quite high. So the energy trans we can make the energy transition happen, but only with shielding policies and uh, yeah, providing a real financial support system for the poor. So basically, it was the situation when the war and the whole energy crisis uh, have started and, and the prices really started to increase. Here, just the last one year data regarding the natural gas, LNG and, and the crude oil. And, uh, you know, so before the war, uh, the European Union really followed this energy trilemma, which means the energy trilemma has three main pillars, the environmental pillar, the energy security pillar, and, and the energy, the prices has to be affordable for the people. And the most important pillar was the environment and combating the climate change. But it changed because of the war and now the energy security became the most important and now it is on the top of the triangle. And of course, the energy strategies also changed. So now we have this long term goal, European Green Deal, and it's uh, how we can make it happen. The Fit for 55 package uh, includes all of these measures and incentives and, and everything. So basically, yeah, our midterm goals, basically. And the latest one is the Repower Europe, which is exactly about how we can be independent from the Russian um, fossil fuel import until 2027. 20, uh, and we have to cut at least two thirds of this import until the end of this year. And here you can also see that now the energy securities issues are the most important ones. So what can the European Union do? So the, it's our conclusion with my colleagues that the only way is to accelerate the energy transition. But now we have to face with a serious crisis because this week Russia uh, started to, or basically it stopped the natural gas uh, supply and, and uh, transport to Europe. So it ha it already happened in Poland, in the Yama stream. It uh, started uh, in the North Stream 1 uh, this week. And yesterday or two days ago, we don't get um, the amount of natural gas which is in the contract to Hungary. Slovakia and Austria. So basically all of our pipelines are, are closed and, and stopped delivering gas. So now we can talk about short term because short term means weeks or maximum months because now it's early summer, few months and the winter starts. So what can the EU do? Of course, we have to support the households, but not only the households, but we have to provide some state aid for companies. We have to do targeted tax reductions. And of course, we have to make backup plans. I mean, uh, how we can buy natural gas from somewhere else, how we can yeah, ramp up our LNG import and so on and so on. So nowadays, there is no way to talk about midterm or long term. We just have to survive the next few months, basically, and the winter. But you see that there are serious differences among uh, the European member states. And uh, I would like to highlight Hungary, because Hungary is always special inside the Euro European Union. And you see that there are many purple cells in this figure. So Yes, nowadays it is the case in Hungary that we already have price caps on, on the fuel. And uh, 
on the other hand, we have uh, or we provide regulated prices for the residential sector. And it hasn't started a few months or a year ago. It has started more almost a decade ago in 2013-14 when the government cut uh, the energy prices for the households and introduced the utility cost reduction programs, which means that the household get the, gets the energy the gas, the district heating, and um, the electricity on a lower price. So it decreased the price of these energy uh, products by 23-25 percentage. And uh, here, so you see that before this program, the prices was one of the highest in the European Union, but as a result of the utility cost reduction program, it seriously declined. And now we are below of the European average, not only regarding the gas, but regarding uh, the electricity. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, it absolutely didn't support the energy transition here in Hungary. It has a real negative effect on energy efficiency improvements, energy conservation. But on the other hand, it was positive for the society. It reduced the energy poverty, the inflation, and it made really predictable, basically, our energy sector. So, of course, as everywhere else, there are positive and negative effects at the same time. So, my conclusion is that, of course, regarding the soaring energy prices, nowadays the vulnerable social group, the needy, have to be protected, so shielding policies have to be introduced. But we, yeah, we should talk about the traditional biomass trap, which means that in Eastern Central Europe, yes, the energy mix of the residential sector don't change, basically. There are no significant movements. And many, many people and households, mainly who are living in energy poverty, still use fuel wood or firewood for heating. It's another question if we want to talk about the business sector and how we can keep up the competitiveness of our entrepreneurships. State interventions, it's really not the European way. We don't believe in state interventions, but now it's a specific time, so who knows what will happen. And, okay, we, the, we can, can we do a campaign for accelerating the energy transition. It really sounds well, but you know nowadays we have to face with huge inflation, inefficient support system. We have, we yeah, we are facing with not only an energy crisis but with a material crisis too. So we have to talk about the supply chain disruptions, the critical raw material shortages, and so and so. And there are other shortages in the labor market, which are also a program uh, problem. And uh, there are many many conflicts and, and contradictions in the European strategy and, and policy documents, but it would be um, another uh, presentation. So, yeah, I just want to highlight a few publications which, was, which were published uh, this year connected to this topic. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you could follow me and everything worked with my PPT slides. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Tepler, for your comprehensive presentation. And I have some of the questions related to the energy factor. And the, uh, what could you say the national energy policy of the Visegrad country? Are there any newly adopted legal frameworks specifically related to the Visegrad countries? Or you just follow up the European Union uh, like the member state strategy, like the national whole policy? like the EU policy in terms of the energy implementation? And what about the Hungarian national policy in the energy effective utilization of the energy and also the, uh, how can I say, like the establishment of the uh, newly adopted energy policy and etc. So we should get count from the perspective of the Wichita country, from the perspective of the EU and also the Hungarian national policy. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's really interesting question because, you know, the Visegrad found and this alliance among the Visegrad countries, Visegrad countries, just for the 
participants. It contains Poland, Czech Republic, or Czechia, Slovakia, and Hungary. And it has historical roots. And it is uh, economical, environmental, and, and social alliance or cooperation. So sometimes they, they do deals to read something in the European Union. But this, allow, this uh, alliance became really weak uh, when the war started because Hungary follows a totally different foreign policy to Russia compared with Poland, Czechia mm -hmm. and then Slovakia. So we are not too harsh on, on Russia in the parliament and in the international stage, basically. So now we can see we can say that the alliance is became really, really weak. And uh, yeah, I, I would question that it can survive the war. On the other hand, it was never about energy. So energy issues was, was never in, in center. Uh, here, the European um, Union, so the European level is the most important because the European Union, the European Commission and the yes. European Parliament yes. set the target. Mm -hmm. Yes, Apollo and, and the nations have to achieve them and, of course, um, yeah, setting national targets, basically. Uh, in Hungary, the energy is really interesting, the energy sector with all of these state interventions, price caps nowadays. And, uh, okay, of course, we want to increase the share of renewable energy sources, but more or less it means only uh, solar uh, energy, so solar PV panels, because our prime minister hates the wind power plants and, and water power plants, so hydropower. So, yeah, the choice or was basically solar panel. Uh, PV panels. Okay, thank you so much for your detailed answers. And yes, actually, I would like to mention that there is some kind of misperception and the behaviors between the European Union and the acceptance of the, any kind of quotas uh, compared to the Visegrad countries, because I'm following uh, these countries, especially the Hungarian energy policy and the relation with the Russia. You know that there is a cooperation with, with the Russia in autumn fabrics, as you know, Hungary is really relying on this issue and uh, yes actually there is some kind of of course the official country is not like the economic alliance but more about the political alliance but when this comes to the european union the european union is more about economic and educational side of alliance of course it's regional organization but it's a, a little bit flair by the political side as well and try to be more collaborative for these countries and i think that uh, the, we need to follow up the political occasion all the time to see the, what's going on for the Visegrad countries and the European Union as well. Thank you so much for your comprehensive presentation. And uh, now we could move on to our final speaker, Mrs. Aysel Musayeva Gurbanova, policy expert on international relations and global politics, international relations coordinator at the International Cooperation Department at Azerbaijan State University of Economics, and my valuable colleagues. Please, the turn is yours. Thank you so much for brief introduction for me. Now, yes, I think that my uh, the screen more uh, visible for now. Is it clear? We couldn't still see, but I think we will do that. Okay, let's start. I think uh, more visible. Not yet. Okay. But maybe you can recheck. Yes, absolutely. Mm, so uh, I think yes. Okay. That's good. Okay, uh, my presentation will be about that. The United Kingdom Energy Security Strategy Model for South Caucasus in the Sustainable Development. Uh, also, our um, the speakers uh, talking about energy security dimensions and uh, some of energy policy of European member countries. But uh, I will special mention that United Kingdom the Energy Security Strategic Model because it's the 
guiding for this sustainable development as a West uh, European uh, energy policy. So the briefly, I will give instruction some of the dimensions with energy security, the pathway of the sustainable development, and the, this the strategic model and South Caucasian model, how we get the adapt uh, adaptation uh, within the, any of the policies. Yes, uh, almost everyone have mentioned that what exactly energy security is including. What uh, I give just uh, driving the, the general framework, what about the, the mention that each details of this strategic model. So some of the concepts is about energy sources uh, and also uh, then managing the basic needs of the energy security policy in the Caucasian, uh, so food lighting, the water and the stational health care for the people, because we need to care for the society and the governmental, um, uh, governmental the policies within the uh, private sector. So this new uh, sustainable development, news, opening the news, the uh, windows for society and government within uh, linkage uh, for a new economic growth and political uh, stability and absolutely prosperity for uh, internal uh, issues. So we mentioned that sustainable development how it gets in the managing the pathway by government and private sector. Yes, we have discussed private um, governmental sectors, what they have in managing this issue within the uh, near the materials what they have in one hand but performing the all of different type of research projects especially the renewable energy resources and arranging with the study travels by the society the members are executing the programs by like as european union member countries and this makes to the fostering that sustainable connection for uh, each of uh, the societies between these the countries so promoting the producer, consumer, and transit countries, how they have to using these energy security corridors in European member the countries. So the public-private the corporation makes the sense for uh, get the new linkage for energy security issues. Um, so what they we have the details for understanding each step of the sustainable development. Yes, energy is a make the, the more centralization the process understanding the several sustainable development goals but united nations have approved 2030 the agenda what they have exactly including but it's so important uh energy security issue for understanding kyoto protocol in the dimension of energy policy the so kyoto protocol much uh, <clears throat> much less supporting the sustainable development in member countries but energy united nations this agenda uh, is including more uh, attribution for understanding uh, energy security issue, how could be linked with sustainable development also in Caucasian country. We will see the more details. So the West full energy subsidies, uh, lowering the fatal air pollution have uh, the managed uh, all European Union countries. So United Nations taking the, the control, promoting the commitment, social progress. So they're not also dealing with uh, the, the states and the states, the uh, energy policy, they have also including the social progress with society, and also is promoting economic growth in these the countries. So sustainable development, um, the becoming the more uh, the protect the planet and the ensuring more way the will of the being of the people, because uh, we are not only in dealing with um, governmental sectors, also private sectors uh, could be including this uh, the the policy. So individuals, corporations, and governments, and nations all of the across the world, we will be uh, they take um, uh, attention uh, to working the, together, achieving uh, all of the common the goals in the United Nations member countries. So they have the setting up long term the goal, not short term ex exactly, because it refers to more sustainable work. What exactly the process in direct way that uh, path. It's like that agriculture and the first the production. The last Azerbaijan uh, the energy policy has including the agricultural uh, managing the process with a sustainable development. So let's take in one hand agricultural and so this production 
and consumption of the pupil in that living the country. And also using by Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, Moldova. We will we see that more details. Yes, good government, research and technology transfer, because technology transfer uh, make the census important to taking the, all of the control, uh, which uh, the driving by the United Nations uh, 2030 agenda. So energy is filling the more the gold and the trade that connections uh, within that economic growth, the social equity and the environmental sustainable. So sustainable, it's uh, covering all of these energy policy dimensions within details of uh, the um, getting the progress in long term goal. So let's take what the United Kingdom setting up the new and latest policy in European uh, the continent uh, as a getting the strategic the model uh, especially United Kingdom uh, getting the more um, special the attention for understanding uh, energy security strategies because they have the setting up each the level of securitization energy policy with sustainable energy. So what they have achieving, they have uh, gathering uh, the, all of the resources for independence, the foreign energy sources. So the carbonization notions power supply. So su supply of the energy resources, um, getting the control with the decarbonization of uh, energy resources. So the strategy um, then chooses like that uh, European the Commission within the joint European action special uh, the, as of uh, the last uh, the March, they have uh, gathered all of the Commission the reports with uh, the make uh, the step, new the step for uh, European country. Uh, member states even if have uh, they have the brexit almost process it uh, as a result of their uh, the internal policy also united kingdom make the census for taking the control uh, european content uh, energy resources so uh, it makes the uh, more affordable securitization energy development and within the sustainable energy so sustainable development opening the new the, uh, the windows with sustainable energy is including we will visit that not uh, what exactly the sustainable energy uh, making the difference to sustainable development so they have the strategy um, that reinforces that decarbonization with new targets like that offshore wind by 2030 uh, what that's exactly mean it's like they targeting the hydrogen production in the same tile with this the frame so the winds and hydrogen production working to together to getting the sustainable energy resources for securitization energy policy so the government feels that oil and gas an important transition to get achievements to sustainable energy what exactly that means is like the fuel and set on the plants to increase the activity uk north sea so also it's um, the big uh that uh, big the problem we will be sure uh, some of uh, countries' internal policies how they get adoption for uh, this level. But the uh, United Kingdom make the census private sector and the governmental sector. The working together it could be the helps uh, the more easily achieving the goals. So uh, these ambitions are crossing the different energy sectors. What ex uh, exactly the sectors have uh, the gathering up in this, this uh, strategy? Oil and gas, wind, the solar nuclear hydrogen networks. Network is newly adding up this, the this type of the strategy in the first time in Europe in the countries because networks, we will be generalization and uh, driving the general framework in this the strategy uh, so which makes the so many um the tips about uh, sustainable energy yes oil and gas and with uh, aiming to the increasing the proportion and domestic uh attributes for uh, producing gas in uk like that's the the general announcement that lower carbon footprint and the uh, we win like the approvals process uh the fast tracking the uh, priority projects uh, like that um, renewable the projects so in, in this type of the targets almost uh, setting up on short wind uh by the uh, the United Kingdom policies and the France. So France and United Kingdom how the big the corporation this onshore wind the process uh, to getting the, these uh, the devices within the easily uh, sustainable energy process. 
So solar and the nuclear is a critical for understanding energy securitization process, how it gets in managing the South Caucasus and the uh, sustainable development. It's like the strategy is not uh, only uh, targeting the solar power, it's also uh, targeting where expectation increasing the five to fold. It's like the 20 GUN by the uh, 20 to five the years. Like that is a big issue for United Kingdom because it's a first time a European the countries uh, outside of the, any country we will be uh, the setting new the strategy within the um, big the big the potent, uh, potential uh, dimension for the solar energy. So uh, they have also adding up the nuclear energy because we not <laughs> we had an option for for, the, for getting the nuclear energy because nuclear energy is main and the basic uh, topping off for European the countries energy the policies. So. So all of the strategies have to make uh, the controlling, just like the targeting of the nuclear output. So Britain project electric demand, we will be getting the more nuclear energy. So decreasing the hydrogen, uh, the, uh, the gas emissions within nuclear project they have emitted. So hydrogen and networking, we will establish in this uh, new the system of polarization. Within transition, uh, South Caucasian energy policy, energy resources with it, uh, within that uh, energy system in the UK. So they have the aiming that end of the this year, uh, the UK, the government will be setting up the whole of the system within that holistic network design and centralized uh, strategic networking plan. They have also uh, made the corp uh, cooperating with the France, the Sweden, and the Switzerland, uh, and the uh, Finland and Norway about these networks because net the networks will be um, more uh, the worldwide uh, energy resources uh, the, to help uh, the using by these the societies. So not only including the governmental policies, also private sectors will, will be contribution to get uh, exactly results for that one. So this signifies uh, the stepping the forward for decarbonization, the targets like that, um, the lights on the specification of uh, the commitments uh, for the cheapest and for the fastest resources like that on short wind in that the societies because they're delivering uh, energy resources in that society is more becoming the sustainable the challenges for governmental sectors managing this process so they were coming the position for like that uh, in the UK conservative party also the first time really in the conservative party we will be getting the result uh, who of the European uh, member of the countries uh, as uh, curing the commission the reports which I previously mentioned that European Commission the reports uh, they will be gathering uh, together for the critics uh, which uh, does not go far enough these the country so really driving the general framework what exactly they will be um, driving the new the picture for these the countries let's take for South Caucasus and sustainable development, yes, the, this region uh, make the special um, the third um, European countries and special United Kingdom as a non uh, the British. Um, uh, the private sector, uh, they have um, the transition there uh, using Azerbaijan, European, uh, make the corporation resources in that uh, development resources. Uh, so this, that's uh, the Sarkocosin model have been introducing with like the far reaching the reform. So boosting innovation, how they have get benefit from the potential, uh, the basic economy uh, in age resources. So it's like that proposal, uh, like the sustainable development. Even if the COVID-19 pandemic issues have uh, give effect uh, to such as uh, circular economy. So economy not including the crisis, economy has a transition to circular within the U uh, European managing energy resources with uh, mainly uh, sub uh, supply countries in the South Caucasian region. So this like that um, energy security has a in the contributing with international relations, uh, each by 
the countries in this region. But they, uh, some of two, and especially two, the international projects have uh, will be boosting uh, innovation in the energy security. Uh, the um, projects like that one belt, one road, and the estimate pipeline. What that makes sense is this the project because this is China has including more cooperation issues in South Caucasus in the first uh, the one belt one world projects and east made pipeline we will be more including Eastern countries like the Uber like the Syria and the process to um, eliminating the energy crisis in that Eastern and Mediterranean countries within South Caucasian strategic the model with, uh, with a sustainable development. So it's like to make the so important these international projects. Also, United Kingdom, the governmental sectors um, taking uh, some of the new innovation to boosting these international projects. So, um, special Azerbaijan is coordinating with Turkey after the Nagorno Karabakh, second Nagorno Karabakh the war to. To take the stabilization, the region, the process, like like the within the international project. So Silk Road also becoming in the transition digital Silk Road. So digital equivalent having including energy security process. So first time technology have using the important role in uh, the make the senses of energy securitization policies, private sector and uh, governmental sector. So what they have aimed uh, each by each uh, the stopping this uh, process. So this mentioned that a sustainable development in the South Caucasus, like these countries uh, being unequal because to uh, the demanding resources by European the countries for uh, supply the process, mainly Azerbaijan, uh, mainly Kazakhstan, and uh, also the Ukraine have the promoted their energy resources to achieving uh, sustainable development goals in that right time. So, wasting the hydro uh, hydrocarbon reserve Yes, and becoming the significant contribute this the process for globalization uh, energy uh, supply the process so global energy security getting economic transition with sustainable energy process in this the South Caucasian model so Caspian Sea especially Caspian Sea regions has a uh, minimizing with South Caucasian model uh, to give directly efficiency and um, effectively way of supplying energy resources so these Caspian regions with which countries has including in what I mean that Azerbaijan Kazakhstan uh, Turkmenistan also could be a country that the producing especially oil and gas outputs for uh, in more boosting incoming uh, these the countries for sustainable development. So uh, aiming to international markets, the region sustainable uh, the issues, uh, it's more helping to uh, stabilization of uh, governmental policies for energy securitization. So uh, unexplored hydro and renewables resources, we will see that what we have um, promoting our potential and the possibility of sustainable development for further growth, for economic side, for energy side, for and also political side of this sustainable development in that region. So energy companies were splitting some of the, the segments. What special the two segments? Decision making the authorities uh, and for like that governmental sectors, we mean that energy ministers, commercial operators, and the vertical, all of the um, the role the members we will see that what we have uh, achieving to um, with together national resources with effective utilization of them. So like Azerbaijan and Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Moldova, and Ukraine, they have uh, almost started their internal uh, the the policies for uh, gathering all of the um, the um, uh, European Commission reports. Uh, what they have uh, started. 
starting and uh, this the process as soon as within the uh, driving the United Kingdom, the strategic model. So all of these governments directly engaging with uh, international companies like that British Petroleum, Mosul, uh, um, demanding and uh, supplying all of the energy resources by uh, the international company. So like that independence to get independence from regulators like that uh, left thing for uh, energy security policies through with that uh, the governmental and energy companies so they have to think that what we have uh, given the support for securities energy resources in the South Caucasus. So how we get the most benefit uh, for economic growth of these the countries also. So especially Armenia and Kyrgyzstan were requiring for the liberation for energy sector development concepts uh, from the United Kingdom and the United Nations uh, 2030 uh, strategic concepts. So, uh, but for Azerbaijan and Georgia and Tajikistan need to replacing their energy sector strategies with new medium and long-term strategies to implementing their sustainable goals. So what then exactly? New medium and long-term strategies, uh, including with making cooperation in initial companies and uh, cooperating with their society also. So you need, uh, including your domestic uh, the policies as a supporting all of these uh, long the process. So collecting uh, renewable energy data in these countries makes it important for combined efforts, centralization in one hand this process and uh, authorizing the local government uh, within the data collection efforts because uh, using the cutting edge technology uh, fertilization data collection efforts we will more uh, um, more risible and reviewing of what they have um, targeting in this process for long term. So placing the important and long needed endeavors for um, energy resources efficiency and boosting renewable energy developments also uh, the helps to get the sustainable energy development uh, their agendas to forwarding the process. So they have almost uh, driving and managing this the process for the domestic issues. So this the process have the uh, have the, the big the um, promotion to new burning the words sustainable energy. So sustainable energy not only including the renewable energy, also United Kingdom strategy have a uh, uh, clashing. Uh, within the common the goals, this the country's aspect of sustainable energy. So raising and the, um, the public governance, what like that uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy, how they will be boosting deployment of modern energy efficiency. So it's like that. So many many important uh, uh, technical issues for modern energy efficient uh, for South Caucasus in countries model. So renewable energy using and uh, including with energy technologies. So without the technology process, they're not uh, aiming any of the goal for domestic the process in that poverty system. So uh, for Caucasian model and United Kingdom, the strategic model as a less latest European uh, energy policy, uh, the, uh, with ha they have the common goal with general energy policy, energy security and market governance like uh, mm, to measuring market demands and the supply and the process, how they get uh, management the system within South Caucasus and uh, main the countries in the United Kingdom. So investment attraction, investment attractions coming by uh, European the countries, how they have taken the control in this process to me measuring their uh, resources in one hand uh, for um, promoting sustainable energy resources. I think is maybe you have understand like that right, driving the general framework how they have assured this the process for understanding. Thank you for attention. If you have the thank you, Aisha, for your comprehensive approach and presentation. As you know, the energy, international law, and the political science is really deeply research side, and we do have more time to discuss more about that. But we have the limited time for that, unfortunately. And uh, I feel I have one question to you. Yes. 
Yes. And what do you think about the, what do you offer for the green economic, uh, in establishment of the green economic area in Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, especially in terms of UK model, Swedish model or Swiss model? It depends on you which model can be more suitable for uh, in the current state. Uh, almost Azerbaijan as a domestic way started, uh, but I have uh, mentioned the details of governmental sectors and private sectors uh, collaborating with together this the process. So as I uh, get the new information uh, from the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh issues, like for Turkish uh, international companies and British international companies, also Switzerland international companies, hey, they have the including to managing this process would affect in short term. Uh, they have the, some of the problems about uh, short term and long term uh, the process for get efficient res result uh, for targets. So uh, they have maybe uh, need to get long the progressive the results for long term mm -hmm. uh, the process um, getting for the new dimensions for energy resources because. As a Azerbaijan energy um, supply, the country they have aiming uh, short term results. But what if you have um, aiming to getting the um, sustainable development in that right time? You need to setting up a long term targetings. And also, I have the mention that there is like that for um, market governance. So Azerbaijan needs to be measuring in Nagorno-Karabakh marketing issues and investment issues. Which country more uh, appreciable and more uh, attributable for investing this uh, the region mm -hmm. because in western countries and marketing uh, measuring the issues we will be easily in long-term issues in Nagorno-Karabakh for getting efficient and effective ways of energy resources. Thank you so much, Aysa, for the detailed answer. And Mrs. Anna, finally, I have a brief questions to you, just a brief answer. Uh, how do you consider the energy conflict from the prime of international law, as you are the expert and the scholar of the international law, and how you could consider how we can solve, if there is solvent in terms of the international law prime or the paradigm or not? We need to just uh, focus on the political sphere to deal with this problem. Well, I think the only potential response would be, and possible response would be to be more cooperative. I think mm -hmm. that the lesson learned by the European Union now with the crisis with Ukraine and uh, the war uh, uh, between Ru Russia and the Ukraine has been very important for us. So uh, the moment we try to play our cards alone in a non-solidarity uh, solidarity model, that would be bad for us. That would be negative for everyone. So uh, it's true that the OPEC will play the the cars also but the only way to to stop this situation and to to be really safe everyone would be being cooperative thank you sorry okay. for all these uh, technical problems it's I have okay it, it's normal yeah. it's commonplace and uh, so i would like to conclude our session entitled energy factor and economic sustainable development of caucuses model i would like to express my sincere gratitude to our valuable speaker and scholar professor anna uh, from Malaga University, so Dr. Uh, Tekla Tep from Miskoc University, Hungary, and uh, our valuable colleague Aysel Musaeva from Azerbaijan State University of Economics. Thanks for taking your time to join us to have a valuable earth-shattering discussion in the field of energy spheres and and I would like to express also my gratitude for the our follower and the participant of our workshop. Thank you so much for taking your time uh, to watch us. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you very much. Have a nice day too. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.